I should say just a word about the materials and how they came into being that are used in clouds. For a long time, I wanted to get to know better some of the music of the Italian composer Luigi Bella Piccola. Now, finally, I got to the library and I did get out one of his scores. It's his one act opera, Bolo di Notte, which means night time. And uh, I started to go through it again. It's an early work, it was written in 1939. And in that opera, I came across the following passage. was the upper part, and it consists of a series of fourths, and they go like this, a perfect fourth, another perfect fourth, another perfect fourth, and an augmented fourth, another fourth, another perfect fourth, and another perfect fourth. At the same time that I was looking at this, I was listening to some of the music of Philip Glass as well, and as anyone who knows, Philip Glass is a minimalist, who uses techniques of uh, extended repetition and also uh, frequently extended arpeggiations, especially those based on triads. I wanted to do a composition using more extended techniques and also using arpeggiations, and in this connection, somehow, these sports that Del, Del Piccolo kind of crept into the composition really uh, rather unconsciously. What I did, though, is that I omitted the outside force, so that, that I ended up with a series of force that went like this. The perfect force, another perfect force, then an augmented force, the perfect force, and a perfect force. So, <clears throat> compositions based on four are not new. They go way back in time. They go back at least to the ninth century. And at that time, music consisted of, formal music consisted more of plain chant, Gregorian chant. Sometimes, so the chant melody had a parallel melody running beneath it, either in octaves or fifths and fourths, and this was called parallel organa. Sometimes the compositions began in a different way, though. Uh, in the example of the, and they separated the third, and then they hit a fourth and moved along in kind of a parallel fashion like that. And that was just called playing organ that came a little bit later. It's kind of fascinating uh, to know how traditions manage to, to persevere and carry on over centuries of time. This, this uh, organic technique, for example, endures to the present day and it's used in different parts of the world. It's even used here in the United States. Um, ethnomusicologists call it folk organ. And one ethnomusicologist extracted the following example from a recording made in 1975 in Sparta, North Carolina, at the Little River Regular Primitive Baptist Church. It uses thirds, parallel uh, force, and fifths. basement where they became the basis of, of harmonic movement. 
In the beginning of the 20th century, though, and towards the end of the 19th, uh, composers like Debussy and Scriabin started using force again, and force kind of crept back in, uh, into popularity. Uh, <coughs> Scriabin, who's noted for his famous mystic chord, uh, actually this chord is constructed on force. It uses, uh, it uses augmented force, diminished force, and perfect force, and it sounds like this. Just as a matter of interest, the sequence of pitches that we use in clouds, uh, if we alter one pitch from this mystic chord Scriabin, we get the same sequence of chords. In the 20th century, many composers based their compositions on fourth, including Honiger and Hindemith, Bartok, Copeland, and uh, here's an example from Albon Barrett in Watson. of pitches that we're going to use in clouds and study the way that they interact, we come up with some interesting possibilities and we use these features in the composition. For example, if we, well first of all, the, the uh, sequence of pitches actually are divided into two trichords. Okay. So if we overlap these and put them together, harmonies in thirds. And if you overlap them so that first one begins and then the other in this fashion, they produce harmonies in sevens. And if we alternate them, so like this, one begins and the other, they produce harmony alternating sevens. These alternating sevens are called cross relations. A cross relation occurs when the pitch in one voice is altered on the next beat in another voice. This too is an age old technique and was used extensively in the 16th century by Renaissance composers. It probably derives uh, out of a 9th century technique called musica picta, which is a system for altering pitches. And it was used up through the Baroque. Some classical composers, Mozart occasionally, Use them, but really they were prohibited in the classical period. Um, composers like Frescobaldi used them, and also Johann Sebastian Bach. And here's an example, an example from Bach, a little hymn from Bach here. Now, this sentence you can hear if we isolate. century, cross relations have been used a lot too, but really it's kind of a moot point whether or not they're really cross relations because of the all overall chromatic fabric in many 20th uh, century compositions. In clouds, however, we use them extensively and deliberately and they are structurally men. So clouds then develops in this way. The left hand arpeggiates almost continuously throughout, and the arpeggiations are based primarily on the force. In the right hand, uh, the right hand plays a succession of thematic events, and these thematic events are constructed out of the interaction of the two kind force which we looked at. That is uh, perfect force thirds, we have it, uh, minor, major and minor thirds, and sevens and all of these cross relations. There is one more technique that we use, but we'll discuss that when we get to it. So, Clouds begins with a long crescendo of about 13 bars. And this crescendo reminds me of kind of like a telescopic, of getting closer to something or something coming closer to me. 
Also, since we're using only the two track cards in the initial 13 measures, these have to count everything. Thematic material, rhythm, harmony, everything. And the whole phrase is kind of stretched out in a classical sense that a phrase is stretched until time has to give over into something else. And say the bass moves down, and then maybe this voice and this one, and then maybe this one, and then this one, and then this bass, and so forth. So they kind of tumble over each other until they reach their destination. Uh, here's a 19th century example of that slip sliding technique. <laughs>
operating in clouds then are some traditional techniques. Uh, that is uh, composition based on thought, slip sliding technique, and cross relations. And uh, they're used in some unique ways. Uh, the most unique, perhaps, is this, that everything derives out of an interaction of these two trichords, and that is force, that is thirds, and cross relations. Um, there are a couple of other interesting things going on. And one is the overall form. Compositions are generally sectioned off in some way or another, even though there's an overall organic whole, still compositions are segmented. And this segmentation occurs through contrast in rhythm, contrast in phonetic content, contrast in harmony, contrast in mood, in this way. But clouds is kind of a consistent uh, uh, uniform composition because of the arpeggiation that is occurring constantly throughout. Also, these thematic events occur successively in, a, in the same way throughout. But there is segmentation in clouds, and this occurs through the, using the intervals in fourths and thirds. First, there's a very long span of time which we use most of the fourths, and then a shorter area of thirds, and then we have the recapitulatory material. Which again uses four. So it's kind of a harmonic ABA form. Uh, the bass, after the initial bass pitch in the composition, never goes lower than itself until it hits measure 201. And that's kind of an unusual feature. And um, so now I think Crystal uh, will play through clouds again. And then if there are any questions, I'll try to answer.
also the fourth create a suspend, suspended view. Yes. I mean, the fourth, of course, is a suspended voice as opposed to the voice that is resolved. The third is the feeling of resolution, or the fourth is suspension. However, the third kind of piece, that was wonderful, suspended, but the fourths, you end with a major third. Now, was your objective to make the piece sort of land and settle it and all that kind of suspension? No, I really didn't think of it in terms of suspension at all. Right? Because uh, when you have all these floors uh, acting consistently the way they are, especially when they pile up on right. top of the shelf. So it's just a little bit of suspension. But I, uh, I don't know if you're referring to, when you, especially if you uh, uh, for us a long time ago, actually was a distance which we saw. But your your ending piece with a major third, I think that you know was the very deliberate, I trust. Uh not well, not necessarily. A lot of things happen in this kind of conversation. Uh, As listeners, did you, when it finally ended, did you feel that something had changed after hearing all this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Well, was it a feeling? Yeah, it was ending. It was ending. Yeah, right. But that's an interesting point. I said, if you really have it. And overall, I think, you know, maybe something in South Korea had it. Um, I was curious if this time when I heard it again, I guess it was just it had a strong emotional feeling of turbulence. I was just curious if it was an emotional feeling that was attached to it in particular or uh, well, I had actually, I had kind of a stuff kind of a dream of this making a piece. But there is a lot of this in the same piece that I actually have. When you say turbulence, were you speaking maybe perhaps of the sudden changes in rhythms that would come up almost unexpectedly, a change in dynamics, but very soft, almost to a triple forte at the um, end? I I sense kind of like a winding, unwinding kind of feeling, and though there was something as as I was trying to think of these two because you know, as you said, in during these two years, there was like just churning up, and then some kind of release or relaxation, and kind of churning up again at some point. Yeah. What was the, uh, I'm always curious in a piece that has a programmatic title to a certain extent. Did you think, well, I'll write a piece about clouds and then find material to do that? Or did the material that you chose fit a particular kind of a piece you were after? Well, uh, titles are sometimes uh, difficult for me. And a lot of times I kind of a piece in fact it's a case for both of the compositions that we're going to talk about tonight based on different types of images that come to mind, especially in my brain images. And that's why uh, I call it clouds. And it's not so much in clouds as it's like looking up at clouds, but it's kind of being up there. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing was that the dramatic outline of the piece, the rhythmic, uh, Direction of it was that entirely organized as the harmony. Uh, your explanation was very thorough about the overlapping uh, tricords and, and this kind of thing. Did the rest was the rest of the piece that well organized in terms of how many repetitions you would do of each thing? And, uh, was it all tightly derived rhythmically from that same from that same? You no, know, that is that um, I got it's kind of hard to organize things like that. I think myself. Uh, no, that's just more of the aesthetic side of things. More subjective? Yes. No. It's 
far as um, are, as far as intention goes, are you concerned with these with um, asking the listener to feel talking about the guidance of the organization? Are you concerned with these with making us feel about the design? Uh, no, not really, because uh, hopefully if what I've written pleases me or at least uh, some other people too. <laughs> Yet, yeah, in composing this, did you expect it to be long or short when you first began? Uh, I really, I didn't know. I, I didn't want it to be terribly long. I didn't. So when you when you compose this piece, you start with the ideas which you told us about. You had some ideas, and you spend a certain amount of time, a period of time, composing it. And then when you felt it was done, it was done. That's right. As opposed to I'm going to write four and a half minutes of music, fill in a blank page. That's right. <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> when was the piece written? Uh, last Sunday. Last July. No, usually in, in reference to what you're, what you're saying, um, I don't think many pieces that way, but I have a certain amount of music that I have to do. Interesting. It's a wonderful freedom in terms of composition. You can put your life in the way you write it down. Maybe close this piece. Right. I suppose if I ever start thinking a little bit about it. <laughs> yes, uh, this isn't really a question. I, I rather enjoyed the seeming orchestration, the, the, the use of the piano in a certain way where, I mean, with the infinite things available, you know, techniques available, you chose the, the sort of bell-like upper overtones. And I, I, I imagine that this ties in with some of the other questions that were asked as far as the emotional connection with I like the that, ethereal. That, I like the top uh, register yeah. piano very much. Uh, I, I use it a lot. Uh, it was very, very effective with the type of army that he was using. Very important. Very idiomatic for the instrument, too. I like the pianist. No, so it couldn't, I, be, it couldn't have been for transpose or anything else. It was just very pianistic. I'm sort of should have kind of died. Yeah, well, it, it does lie comfortably in the hands. And it does feel very pianistic. Sit on the damper pedal for five minutes and just feel so great watching sound. It's interesting that we were talking about the upper register of the pianos, the bell had a quality up there, that you chose bright clouds as opposed to dark clouds. But sometimes tumultuous ones. What? But sometimes tumultuous ones. Well, if there aren't any more questions, why don't we take a short intermission and come back and listen to answers four and five by the end of the jurisdiction.
dance, you can alter the pitches three order them still another way. And here, we want to create a kind of dreamlike sequence. So what we have operating then are these moves that we want to create and the materials that we're creating them with this collection of pitches. In the middle is the manner in which we manipulate these pitches. In these cases that we described, they're all of a variational nature. We used uh, <coughs> arpeggiation to begin with, then trills, more arpeggiation, and for the deep dream sequence, tremolos, and a kind of a syncopated uh, rhythm. Um, so this variational technique Again, it's very traditional. Using traditional, though, I don't mean reactionary. Stravinsky said that the composer's job is to refit old chips, and this is how I mean traditional. Uh, other ways in the dances that use some unconventional methods uh, are in the first movement, for example. And this is one long melodic line of about 30 bars or so, a rather kind of disjunct a dissonant melodic line, and use only one chord one time. Uh, this is a sampling from it. <laughs> on the fourth measure, in fourth measure, on the first beat, these pitches occur. Now these are the same pitches that we've already talked about using to create this, these moves. Um, <clears throat> so this is kind of an abstraction then from the melodic line, a variational type of abstraction. The first measure sounds like this. And this becomes the motif which we use elsewhere in the movement. The motif is just a melodic kind of fragment that can be used uh, often in altered in form to create continuity in the composition. And here's an illustration of that. So here we have a kind of motivic extraction. Another way that we extract from this melodic line is a more exact extraction. Again, another kind of just jump a little thematic element, the motif. Now we can use this in a traditional way as a closure or potential point later on in the dance. So, <clears throat> we're using all these techniques now to try and create different moods. Um, it also describes, however, a larger traditional working. For example, Anton Weber, who is one of the, the uh, most unique and unusual composers of the 20th century, one whom many composers emulated, especially after the Second World War, felt that all composition was essentially a thematic kind, kind of working. He thought that the theme over long periods of time had got work under itself to become the fabric of the composition, the harmony, and the counterpoint. Uh, we saw an illustration of that in the earlier part of the program, in the organic example, where the theme had been directly put under itself to provide an harmony. Weber himself used the fugue as an illustration, and the fugue um, is a good illustration because it begins with the subject by itself, then a counter subject based on that subject often, and then a consequential manipulation of the initial idea of the subject to form the body of the whole view. So we can see that in the way that we've been extracting from the first movement and the, and the and fifth dances, that it's using this older kind of traditional method. But there's also a more unconventional method going on all the time, and that's found especially in the harmony. For example, 
using again this little extraction from the fourth measure. If you look at these more closely, they consist of four pitches. Two are semitone apart, and the other are uh, another interval. <laughs> well, originally there are seven, but here we converted them. So now, these pitches establish the basis for harmonic movement, movement throughout the band of fourth dance in this way. The seconds, this diad, this pair, can move up or down but it never changes. This interval can move up or down, but it does change. It does change. And other intervals can be added on top of this and another pitch is added to this. So a reduction of this sounds a little bit like this. First the first the two of a semitone of bar, and then the other one. And then some added pitches. And then it goes on like that. We'll do a little bit of it. Choosing materials, of course, you get into musical personality and likes and dislikes, and these start building up into stylistic traits and so forth. I like to work in this manner of, of uh, kind of interaction with traditional and non-traditional methods. It seems to suit me, but I also like to work using unconventional materials in unconventional ways. For example. Uh, you can establish the kind of harmony, like you did in the fourth movement, and create a, a harmonic system and use it. We can also take a, a musical concept, develop a musical thought, a concept, and try to turn it into reality. For a long time, I've heard music as kind of in space, sometimes, I get this way. And within this space, there's a certain movement, depending on the style of the music. Chromatic music moves a certain way, and uh, 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 tonal music and modal and uh, microtonal and electronic, they all have their own movement within this kind of space. And I wanted to get this space idea into some kind of realistic treatment or form. <clears throat> it's kind of similar to the painter Kandinsky especially in his 1920s and 1930s paintings where he creates a space on the canvas and on this canvas then he has these little configurations and events going on. So uh, that was what I was trying to achieve and I think in the fourth dance it finally happened a little bit. We created the musical space by a wide separation of pitches from very low to very high. And in this space, these little events and configurations go on.
Tone clusters or packet pack dissonance are another one of those uh, more modern techniques. Yet, it's almost traditional. They were invented first by Henry Powell way back in 1913 and have been used intermittently ever since. Um, <clears throat> some composers, like Christoph Pendereski, for example, uses uh, clusters and sound mass techniques to build entire compositions, even entire large scale works, like his opera, The Devils of Luton. Um, we use sound mass, not sound mass, but clusters. In clouds also, an example we just described, and here's another use of each other, here with a more soaring one. We can also unpack the dissonance to create a more constant kind of sound. That's a more modern concept, perhaps, but spreading the chord is very old and traditional. Here's an example of that. So what we've been talking about then are different techniques, an interaction of traditional and non-traditional techniques and methods in order to create a certain kind of mood. Whatever kind of mood we're going to create, uh, of course, depends, has to depend on one's intentions. And my own intentions are to try to create, to reach this creative state, this abstraction that is art, and assess this abstraction, I believe, that we all participate in whenever we, whenever we partake of the artistic experience. So in my music, then, I try to get across this gap from craftsmanship over to the ideal of, of art, or the sonorous image, this musical thought, the sessions of Copeland we're talking about. So that uh, kind of wraps up my investigation of these pieces. Here's the who's going to play it through the fourth and fifth dance. I didn't mean to say a word about why we didn't discuss the other dances. And the reason we didn't is because really uh, the same times, the same types of techniques are going on in those dances, and I thought just using a couple of them up and was enough. And so now here's who's going to play through the dances, four and five, and then she's going to talk a bit about them from the piano standpoint. And then we'll, we'll answer any more questions if possible.
decided to work on. They're very challenging in, in a lot of ways, and um, there's just a tremendous amount going on musically. And the pieces that, to me, have a lot of feeling in them. Um, I was not aware of what was going on technically in terms of the, the compositional craft until I'd worked on them a long time. And then, then things started popping out at me, and I realized that this was related to that, and that was related to this, and that sort of thing. But just all along, I had a sense of, of coherence and, and real feeling um, beneath all this craft. Um, and I, I like the pieces because they, they do take in the full range of the piano art and kind of sounds. So, um, very clear sounds, very uh, short sounds, and very huge washes of sound. Um, it's just fun to play that kind of music. Um, and also they're, they're challenging in that uh, there are little lines that you want to bring out in the middle of a tremendous amount of other things going on. And it's just interesting to, to work on these the challenges to that way. Um, and they're, they're beautiful because they, they keep going and going. And, um, I, I like that kind of music. I don't like music that stops and starts and stops and stops. I like music that keeps. It has a drive and uh, has a direction and a, and a arrival point. Um, also, I would like to say that it was wonderful working with this composer. Um, he gave me a lot of leeway in my interpretations, um, and although we didn't always um, agree on how to do that, um, mostly it was that, um, well, really it was just one one particular thing that we um, disagreed about, and maybe I should try to illustrate it. It's in the in the fourth band. I just felt that. The sounds are so incredibly beautiful that I wanted them to ring for hours and hours, and he kept, you gotta play it after. But this, this section. No, it isn't. That's my own invention. Because he wants those notes so loud. I mean, they should be played so percussively that on a black note, there's a likelihood of falling off and slipping off. Right. And so I just didn't like it. <laughs> you can get away with that in the next century music, you know. That's her plus two. Well, I've got some questions. Kirsten, <laughs> uh, did you care to interject at any point? I always do so. Okay. Shape your thoughts. Uh, again, I think this question stems from the title, Dances. Uh, what is your involvement with dance before? What has your experience with dance? Well, uh, I've always wanted to work with dance. In fact, the truth is, one of the reasons I became a composer was to dance. That was due to uh, the experience I had uh, uh, watching and listening to the podcast Romeo and Juliet several years ago. And it was such a powerful experience that I really feel that that has something to do with my composer. But I've always wanted to work with dance. In fact, I worked with Nancy right now, Jane Schneider, who's here, and we're going to work on dance composition together. But when you wrote this piece, when did you write this piece? This is written about a year and a half. A year and a half. When you wrote this piece, you said earlier that you had images in your mind of dance, I and mean, then you, you saw a movement. Yes, yeah, sometimes uh, even episodes. But I, I, I'm not knowledgeable 
enough about mass to think of the transition to program itself. Right. Now, since you wrote this piece, has this piece been given to choreographer or dancer? No. No. Um, yeah, right now, in my notes, I'm getting to the end of my notes. Right. And you, you wrote this yeah. as an orchestral, you have an orchestral version of this yes. piece. Is this, a, is this a reduction of that orchestral? No, this piece was written first. Oh, it was written for piano, piano first? Yes, it's piano. And you orchestrated what we heard for the right. orchestra. Well, that, I thought it was. No, it works both ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've done that a couple of times. And uh, I don't know, I, um, I guess I kind of like having things sometimes in my world. At least uh, when it comes to our guests. Now, are you collaborating with the choreographer now? Yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> right. OK, I think it's just interesting from from the point of view of writing a piece of music and having the image of dance images, okay, and not for whatever circumstances, not working with a choreographer or a dancer at the time you wrote dances four and five, and a different situation would be working with a choreographer and or a dancer while you're creating something. <clears throat> yes, it's, it's a lot, it's a big difference because, well, uh, we can just we can talk about different kinds of ideas and potential moves. Mm -hmm. kind of so with the latter, perhaps there's a more fusion of the two art forms of dance and music. I think so. This, this collaboration, which unfortunately is not too common nowadays. I think it's very common for a choreographer or a dancer to take an existing piece of music that may not have been written for dance at all. Maybe the composer was thinking of, I don't know, uh, trucks. <laughs> and someone heard this piece of music that the composer wrote for trucks and saw wonderful uh, Tom Lewis and Brown Bob Moss. I have this argument with, with dancers too. Mm -hmm. Because most of the repertoires are pieces that are not the Right, exactly. Romeo and Juliet is one of those as well. And also, many of the things that we Well, we need to hear from you. Yes. David, uh, when you do uh, an orchestral uh, version of the piano piece, do you make a note for note transcription, or do you find that the some of the substance gets changed too? Uh, you have to change the substance sometimes. Uh, in this case, the case of this kind of composition, however, a lot of it was note uh, substance. A lot of times you do have to change things around. I wonder for both of you, David, you must play the piano, right? I don't. I use the piano rather than play it. Now, my instrument is the French horn, and that's the only instrument that I really play well and I can play it. But were you composing on the piano? Yes, it was the piano. But I wonder, when you play a piece and your interpretation becomes so personal, I mean, you said sometimes people interpret this is not going to work out, but they have like, how do you feel when you see, here's a play, you know, an emotional way, is that? In an emotional way? Yeah, it is. Oh, I like it when she plays it in an emotional way, because sometimes we have disagreements. Sometimes emotions don't come, so I don't know what you have It's not so much the emotions, it's the matter of achieving the emotions. And things like tempo, for example, or sometimes the way something is phrased, or perhaps <laughs> dynamics, or something like that. Um, so I don't know. We have we've had several disagreements, but we usually try and talk it over. And uh, when Kirsten said sometimes uh, I'll get it right, sometimes, sometimes I'll, I'll see that she's right, and sometimes she'll see that I'm right, and sometimes. We never, 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 never,
you wrote the piano, the piano version first, right? That's right. Uh, when you were writing the piano version, did you uh, have any ideas you might uh, write an orchestral version? Did that influence your... Uh, yes. Right. At the same time, was I yeah. planning on doing it? Right. Ah, uh, yes, I was. Yes. But essentially, it's really not that. I mean, there's there's some essential differences, but uh, it's really the same piece. I mean, in sense. I'm sorry, really about it's really the same piece. Uh, I mean, in the sense that there are that I mean, it changes as far as uh, making it sound like an orchestra work. But are there really distinct changes in pitch and things like that? No. Well, one one section right? so that there was wrote. Wrote more than, than two hands could play. We right. had sort of yeah. orchestral things in mind, and we had to change that to make it more fantastic. I have a question for our audience. If you did not know all that you know about the pieces with David Irving, and I were to play a recording of your the first one we're hearing, she could play Clouds, and then she could play Dances 4 and 5. Would you think that they were written by the same composer? And if so, why did they not why? I lost you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just venture a very top of the head sort of thing. Uh, and you'll, you'll, you'll get the kind of answer the kind of question which is yes and a no. Oh, all right. <laughs> uh, the, there are certain basic techniques mm -hmm. that seem to be the same. Mm -hmm. Certain certain type of the arpeggio sort of thing. Every every composer is entitled to his mood and his style. A variety of moves. Uh, in fact, I, I respect the composer who can have a variety of movies, you know. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, it, it's, it's almost an unfair question, in a sense. Well, I, I have a motive behind that, and that is that I, I think that as different as they are, you can still recognize a consistency of a style. There is a style yeah. there. Yeah. There are some similarities uh, within the two pieces, even though they are different. Yeah, it's not something you could really put into words. There's a certain very marked uh, stamp of mm -hmm. the signature uh, material sense to use its usage. But uh, so again, I couldn't put it into words. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Well, this is. Um, I think this is what happens when a uh, composer has his or her own voice, and uh, it's why every time you hear a piece by Chopin. Um, there's no mistake in it, or modern or Mozart. Exactly. And um, because maybe in each composer there is just one melody seeking expression. And um, of course, this is expressed in a variety of ways and in a variety of forms. And so I think that's how it is that we can recognize that there are similarities. Mm -hmm. that's, really that's why I asked that. There are also basic attractions that a composer has that yes. leans toward. Exactly. It's, it's almost, once he gets it in his musical beingness, so to speak, it's almost impossible for him to not incorporate it without changing his personality. Does anyone have any thoughts or would like to ask David Irving or Pearson Soderberg? Uh, David didn't bring up the idea of creativity. Which I think is an incredible subject in itself. Uh, I mean, I know that we have people in our artists tonight who are indeed creative in ways, whether it's musical or not musical. Uh, does anyone have any, any thoughts or any questions around that weird creativity or the beauty process of the music? Yeah, well, I'm not sure that's exactly the question, but. What intrigued me before was when you brought up the idea of talking about working with a ballet dancer and whether uh, you know fitting the composition to 
with working with someone as opposed to creating something after. Do you feel stifled in any way where you could work with a set form, let's say working with, with putting poetry to music or well, working I, with with a set structure of let's say background music that has to have a set structure as opposed to having it come to you with a structure afterwards. It's a, it's a different manner of working. I've done that. I have done that. <clears throat> but how do you how do you see the difference as far as the creative process? Do you feel stifled or do you find it a different type of challenge? No, because you uh, I think uh, I think uh, compositionally one sets up this kind of uh, a, a bit a structural idea that you can work in with anybody, whether it's some terms of <clears throat> or, or harmonies that you're using, and there are some kind of structures that you, you're going to use. If you're using words, then uh, you're using a variety, variety of ways um, you can follow the meaning that you tend to. It's just different. But then there's going to be, I have a very personal reason for asking. I'm working on a piece where I have to work with a poet is doing some T.S. Eliot poems. Mm -hmm. Now, our interpretation of the mood may be different enough to create some sort of friction between us. I don't wow. know. I just wanted to get your own feedback. I see what, what, I, I see what, I see what you mean. You know? Um, well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard, especially when you get when all are, you are working together and they have very individual ideas. I think uh, there's a bit of give and take that just as you do. Do you find that it stifles your own sense of creativity? If it stifles it too much, I wouldn't be able to do it. So. We would think that the two different art forms would intrigue the artists. And I think that's, that's the right chemistry, I suppose. And that's what I think any two artists work together to strive for and seek in one another. So as opposed to being stifled, it's actually challenged, uh, challenged and intrigued and brought out. Uh, yeah, I think that's a good point. If you if it's if it's becoming stifling, maybe you're just working with another person. I hope it's not the best one. Yeah, right. I mean, I okay. just, are you doing the music for someone with poetry or yeah? Are you a composer? Yeah. Part time. He's a poet. David, what are you working on now? What's your present composition? Um, well, I just finished a guitar, a guitar piece this thing, and as I mentioned, I'm working on this dance composition, and uh, I have also had it in this summer. Uh, well, I'm also finishing up a violin, violin piece, and that's going to the solo violin, or it's, it's another piece of violin and piano, but it's definitely intended for orchestra. And uh, I finished that up. Uh, oh, great. I look forward to hearing all these new compositions. If there aren't any, any further questions or comments, uh, I would like to remind you again that we have this notebook if anyone would be interested in having a set. Let's go ahead, including some balloon pieces. And on your way out, we have some flyers from our upcoming events. We're going to concentrate this Thursday, next Tuesday, next Friday, and next Tuesday, next Thursday, June 13th. So by all means, uh, take some flyers. Welcome to the museum. We hope to see you again. And I would personally like to thank David Irving and Kirsten Silver for a wonderful evening.